live from the Deer and Deer Hunting Headquarters. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Deer Talk Now podcast. This is number two of the new format of the podcast, and I'm glad you could join us. Today we have a special guest, Shane Simpson. He is a tremendous hunter. I don't know if you follow Shane, but he's all over the place on the web, on YouTube, on social media, but we're going to talk about mostly about blood trailing right now. I'm going to give Shane a little bit of an introduction here because he does a lot of different things, but stay tuned with us for the whole program today. We're going to go through a lot, and also we're going to give you information on how to find some of the videos and other things that we've been talking about. But anyways, we have Shane Simpson. Shane is, um, you might know him from Calling All Turkeys. He's a champion turkey caller. I know Shane's won like 20 different titles, including several state titles for his turkey calling. A heck of a turkey hunter. I would love to talk turkey hunting, but we're not doing that today. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have, uh, Shane also does public land whitetail hunting, which is absolutely fascinating. I, I did that a long time ago. We talked about that in the first podcast. But uh, we're also going to talk mainly about the show that I really like, and that's how I pretty much discovered Shane. Is It's called the Cali Chronicles. Shane, can you give us just a little bit of background on your history and how you came up with the idea for these online programs? Oh, wow. You got time uh, for a long story. I'm not going to do three hours, uh, so, so we're going to try uh, to keep it short. Yeah, I was just on a podcast about three hours the other day. Uh, anyway, yeah, so I moved up to Minnesota, and um, I came from a state. I always kind of filmed my hunts and, and whatnot, but um, didn't do much with them, just kind of shared them with family. Started hunting with uh, other folks up here in Minnesota, turkey hunting, just to try and extend my season, you know, after I bagged my one bird. And I found the easiest way to share those videos with the hunters I hunted with was to put it on YouTube, and then they could just share the link and watch it whenever they wanted to. Uh, That kind of grew into a online turkey hunting show. So I started, I got into tracking deer with a dog. Uh, There's a long story how I got involved in that also people were you know they'd read my stories online on facebook social media you know pictures to go along with it and they're like yeah man you got to video these tracks this sounds so interesting so i kind of figured out a way to document those tracks best i could and show what we were seeing out there in the woods while we were tracking deer um video of my deer hunts you know everything that i do out there in the outdoors i i try to not only for my own memories but i think some some of the stuff is fascinating for other people to see and and I enjoy watching other people hunt. And so I, I try to make an effort and make a good quality, something that makes people feel like they were actually there, part of the hunt, using a bunch of action cameras and whatnot to get multiple angles. But uh, that's kind of the gist of it. That's, you know, that's what drew me to your videos is because it's it's real life, um, basically unedited. And especially your blood trailing um, videos, are they're not only entertaining, But they're so educational, from my opinion. Um, Not just, I think the thing that people get caught up in is, oh, he's got this dog and the dog finds him. Well, yes, but the way you're showing on how these blood trails unravel, you know, the behavior of the deer, especially wounded deer behavior, I think so much can be learned from that. How did you get into, I know it's probably a long story, but like, tell me specifically about uh Callie which is your fa- most famous dog right I mean how did you get mm-hmm. into wh- what what started with her and how did you get into filming those um well I'll tell you how I got started with a, a tracking dog um number one I, I went to a media hunt turkey hunt um Brian Lovett was there you know oh, Brian oh, yeah and yeah. um so, and, and JJ Wright and some other fellows and oh, we were gosh. turkey hunting down in Illinois and we met a fellow down there, Tracker John, and you may know him too. He's mm-hmm. a very popular dog tracker, deer tracker. And we would sit around camp at night and he would just tell these stories about tracking deer. And they were so fascinating. And, and I told him then, I was like, man, you need to start videoing these things. They sound so you know, in, in, intriguing. Um, but I left there, you know, with a kind of a, not really a passion, but a, a, a high interest in maybe getting a dog for myself. When I came back to Minnesota, I think it was a, another deer season or two later, I was videoing a buddy, he uh, deer hunt, he shot a deer. We didn't have much of a blood trail. He didn't get much penetration. We, we tried to track it ourselves. We actually enlisted the help of people on social media in the, in the area that they wanted to help come grid search the next day. 
had several volunteers, but uh, seven o'clock next morning, no one showed up at the meeting spot except for us. <laughs> and so we were left alone grid searching. And right then I was like, man, I can't, I can't do this. I can't rely on other people and, and our eyesight and the lack of blood. I'm getting me a tracking dog. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And so that later that year, I, I got Callie. And that's like almost a decade ago, isn't it? No, not not quite that long. It was about seven years ago. Seven years ago. Um, okay. Or six years ago, sorry. She just turned five this past fall. So this was her fifth tracking season. I had a year. I had her a year prior to her first season, uh, just training and and you know waiting for the next year. Did you like around. research that? I know she's a coon dog, isn't she? I mean, the, the best uh, blood trailing dogs I've ever seen are these little uh, wired haired dachshunds. But mm -hmm. I know coon dogs have good uh, noses. Is did you research that, or did you just wind up picking her for? No. Um, so I did research it. I researched not only how tracking dogs work and how to train them but also you know the different breeds and like you alluded to one of the more popular breeds uh these days is the wire haired dotson very popular in europe and a lot of people here like to use them they're very small dogs very great uh, great tracking dogs just about any dog can track if you uh, you train them well um my only issue or concern was because i live in minnesota and track in minnesota there's a lot of marshes here, a lot of water. How's that little dog going to perform in you know, yeah. a foot of water? And that was the question I asked some of the other trackers. And, and they said, well, well, we just pick if the blood trail ends up at a swamp or a marsh, we just pick the dog up and carry it to the other side and try to pick up the blood trail on the other side. I didn't want to have to deal with that. I said, I need a dog that's taller and can manage water on its own. So I started looking for a little larger breed. Um, and I wasn't dead set on a blue tick coon hound, which is what Callie is. I was looking for some type of hound. I actually uh, looked at a, uh, was it a red bone? And that deal fell through. The guy that I was going to get the dog from ended up backing out. He just basically ghosted me. I don't know if he <laughs> found somebody with uh, that. They're back here at wrestling now. That <laughs> wanted, offered him more money or what. Hey, hey, stop that. <laughs> Just pause for just a moment. That's all right. Give me one second. One of, the, one of these things you can't plan for. This is uh <laughs> Be right back. Callie needs to go outside. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you right. did not, you did not interrupt me too much. She ran back upstairs. Uh, anyway, so he, he kind of ghosted me. And I, I don't know why, maybe someone offered him more money. But uh, I found a Craig listing for Cali or some blue ticks. I went and actually looking for a male dog. The guy that I was getting from had his daughter round up all the male dogs, put them in the truck, and he met me at Walmart over in Wisconsin, right across the border. And I had my daughter pick out one of the pups. We got home, and then I re looked at the dog and realized it was a female, not a male. <laughs> So when his, when the, the guy that had the dogs had his daughter, she accidentally grabbed a female. When I had my daughter pick out one, she picked the female. I guess they both thought it was a, a good dog, but I decided to keep her at that point. Uh, she's turned out to be a, a great tracking dog. And, um, and then I just went from there training her. I started out training as soon as I got her at like eight or nine weeks old. So where did you grow up hunting, Shane? Where did, I mean, cause I know you're a heck of a woodsman. So you had, you had a lot of skill coming into this. Where did you grow up deer hunting? Yeah. I, so I grew up in South Carolina. Um, our family had about 50 acres. We, we had, our family as a whole had a lot more land when, when I was real little before I started hunting and it got sold off in different sections and whatnot. And, by the time I started hunting, we only had about 50 acres left. And my dad didn't hunt. Uh, he was a long distance truck driver. He was gone most of the time. And basically I learned on my own uh, really? reading books, oh. magazine. Yeah. And just going into the woods as a kid playing and, and hunting and learning all that stuff on my own. Um, and so then when I was about 14, I, I decided I wanted to start video hunts or my, me and my brother and whatnot. I actually saved up my money and bought one of those big shoulder mounted VHS oh recorders, gosh. you know, had the big, yeah. Yep. So I would video dove hunts, deer hunts, turkey hunts. And I wish I still had some of that footage, but it's been lost to time. Um, but so I know uh, you're yeah. really good. I don't mean to cut you off. I know you're really good friends with the guys from Mossy Oak 
and the guys over at Primos. Well, I'm, I gotta t- I gotta I gotta insert the sidebar here. You're talking mm. about those big beta cams. So one of my first hunts in the industry was with Cuz and Troy and Tack from Mossy Oak. Now this is going. I think mm. it, I think it was 1995, and uh, Troy at the time was carrying one of those beta cams. And I said, oh, come on, how heavy can that be? And he gave it to me. I, I held it for about a minute. And I said, no, here, you can have that back. So I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about, those big, huge those big, huge cameras. Um, so you yeah, actually would, started doing that been, when you were a teenager. Yeah, so it been, would have been about a few years earlier than when you went with Cousin then um, that I got that first camera. So it had been like 1990, oh my 91 gosh. or something wow. like that. Um, and, yeah, so... I, I didn't have any way of editing the cameras back then had a way to plug it into the TV and you kind of, you could audio dub and, and stuff like that, but it was very crude. And I really didn't do much editing. I just would pop the tape in and fast forward it and show my family. Okay. Here's the deer I shot, you know, or my brother shot. And, um, and th- thankfully, uh, you know, modern technology, I was able to get one of these little uh, smaller cameras and, and go from there. Um, and, you know, I had the little mini DV, camcorders handy cams and it wasn't until 2009 that i got my first hd camcorder that i really started putting a focus on producing a more quality content that someone wasn't going to sit there and be bored watching for you know whatever length of time okay and so now i don't i don't want to <laughs> fast forward through too much uh people can go to your channel and it's really easy actually if you want to find shane's videos uh his website is Shane Simpson hunting.com or YouTube. It's just Shane Simpson hunting YouTube backslash Shane Simpson hunting. Um, all that background um, on how you trained Kelly and how she started. I, I know you have video proof and video you know, documentation there. What I wanted to do today was fast forward a little bit and talk specifically about the things that I see that you experience um, out in the field. Uh, some really cool videos where, you know, somebody shoots a big buck, and I, I, I've seen it so many times where they've given up, you find it, and then the joy you get to experience there. But I want to talk specifically about what are some routines that you see routinely? Because I know you've been on – how many tracks do you take a year? It, it's got to be – uh, Well, I don't take a whole lot because I, I deer hunt myself because I don't want to miss that aspect. So I take about 30 to 50. 40 tracks we'll that's say a lot. Um, i mean i would say, yeah. I'd say that's a lot of blood trails <laughs> well i guess i'm comparing to the other trackers i have friends that i know one guy he took well over 200 tracks wow. this year Dang. um there's other other trackers that don't deer hunt and they take you know up, upwards of 100 tracks a year Man. hey we know what that sound means it means we're going to take a break to thank one of our sponsors Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Easton Archery and the all-new 5mm Autumn Orange FMJ. Celebrating Easton's 100 years in archery, the 5mm Autumn Orange FMJ is a fresh take on an old favorite. Featuring Easton's exclusive FMJ aero technology and finished with the classic Easton Autumn Orange anodized finish. This limited edition offering gives archers a modern arrow with a throwback nostalgia to arrows they may have never put in their quiver before i did i had those original autumn oranges when i was younger these are available in four popular sizes 250s 300s 340s and 400 spines and it also includes hit inserts and five millimeter x knox installed very 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 cool i will be shooting these arrows in that throwback autumn orange while hunting for deer and deer hunting tv this year on our pursuit channel shows you might already know i'm a big fan of the fmj line to begin with these arrows are skinny they're straight and they pack a punch my particular setup those arrows are 11.3 grains per inch plenty enough power i'm getting there on downrange kinetic energy even though i'm only shooting 54 pounds this adds up to a mighty wallop downrange on whitetails check them out at your nearest easton arrow dealer or visit eastonarchery.com for more information wow um, there's no shortage of tracks available so how do you um, pick and choose wanna... which tracks you go on um well it, it depends on when i'm off work and when i'm not hunting so 
uh, that's uh, kind of a little sidebar too. The reason in, uh, in the last few years I started traveling to deer hunt, which is something I've never really planned to do, um, was so I could have time to hunt. Um, deer season here in Minnesota starts mid-September, so I started going to Nebraska and North Dakota that opens like the beginning of September. And to get a few weeks in of my own personal deer hunting, because when I when tracking season starts or deer season starts here in Minnesota, those days are limited. Uh, this past year, I tried to forcefully limit myself. It's it's, it, I feel bad if I don't take a track. Uh, it just I feel guilty, and I probably shouldn't. Um, I know I know a lot of people. They they say, man, you, there's nothing you can control about that, you know. But I feel guilty sometimes because I have a dog that's capable of possibly find their deer and here I am just wanting to go deer hunting for myself so uh, sometimes I sacrifice my deer hunt to go help them out but I work uh, a full-time job uh, mostly uh, it's on the weekends so that's usually when we get most of our tracking calls but during the week people hunt fella calls or texts me and says hey I got a, a deer I shot the biggest factor is how far away from me are you mm -hmm. can I if it's on a work night you know I've had to work the next morning how can I drive there, track it, and I expect to be there two to three hours at the max? You know, um, I, I kind of allow for that amount of time. Sometimes we're there, you know, five or ten minutes when we find the deer. But sometimes it can take hours. And I factor that in whether if I feel like I'm going to be out all night and won't get any sleep, whether I take the track. And then also um, I try not to filter the tracks, as they like to call it, like I look for high probability odds of recovery and just take those because you can find some of the other ones that have low probability. Um, but I do talk to the hunter and say, look, this sounds like a high shoulder shot. You got limited penetration. Uh, and a lot of times I'll ask them questions or, or, you know, basically try to help them make their own decision, whether they want me to come out. You know, you hit a high shoulder, limited penetration. I bet the blood trail went about 200 yards and then just stopped. And they were like, yeah, exactly. Was the blood just bright red? Oh yeah, it was nice and bright red. Well, that's how shoulder muscle hit um i can come out if you'd really like me to but i don't think you're going to recover this deer and so i'll give them my assessment of it and then let them make the decision sometimes they want me to come out anyway other times they've already kind of decided that they know the deer is not mortally wounded um, and they just call and get my advice or maybe you know hopefully get me out depending on you know, what transpires what about a situation where you know and that's one thing that i've picked up on your videos is that you do a great job on that because as, as far as what Thank one you. thing one thing that I've always told people is the much information that you have you have to make an educated guess or decision mm -hmm. and you're yeah. constantly asking where was the deer standing how what, how did it react where was where's the last time you saw it you know some of those types of things I and mean, where is the blood and hopefully you didn't mess it up and walk all over the place and have five guys yeah. in there but um what is your thought process when you get on the phone with somebody and now you're like looking at that's uh, probably it is a gut shot you know what are you um what are your what is your process for when you pretty much have deduced that yeah i'm probably dealing with a gut shot here well i, I, I kind of run down the entire process someone texts me and they and they say hey are you available and i start sending them questions you know like um and i'll send them a little picture of a deer with a grid on it. All right, where, how was the deer standing? Was it quarter away, quarter two? Where'd you hit it on this grid of this picture of this deer? Um, and then they tell me that, and I kind of speculate where I think it, what organs it hit. Was it a pass through or not? Because if you get a pass through, you, you obviously hit more parts of the deer as the arrow goes through. Um, what does the blood look like? What does the arrow smell like? And it, a lot of times they don't, the hunters don't smell their arrow. Uh, they they just look at it and see oh there's blood on it and they get excited about it. When I arrive at the scene, um, if they're you know at the house, we spend a few times talk a few minutes talking about you know what happened. I'll ask the same questions again to see you know get confirmation of what they said the first time. If they have the arrow there, I'll smell it. I go to the hit site. I kind of check things around and and but I I don't I I kind of get a general idea of what what I think is going on or where they hit. I don't get to the point that like I'm a, a, um, an FBI agent or CSI or whatever mm -hmm. and nitpick every little detail. 
Um, a lot of this, you just have to take the hunter's word for where they think they hit. Sometimes we don't have an arrow to inspect. Sometimes we don't have blood to inspect. I just basically say, okay, the deer was standing here. Um, that also determines wait times, depending on where we think the deer was hit. If it's a double lung, you know, ch chest cavity, uh, heart, you know, in that part of the, the deer, we'll track sooner. You know, the deer's probably dead, if that's uh, correct in their assessment where they hit it. If it's farther back, you know, liver or something like that, six hours minimum. If we think it's gut, we'll wait overnight to 12 hours minimum. The, some trackers, I mean, trackers as a whole have a general guideline of wait times. Um, I've, a lot of them like to wait a little longer than I do. I kind of go in at the minimum and, uh, you know, because. What is your minimum I, I for gut shot? Uh, 12 hours. 12, okay. And. Yeah, I have gone before that just because of certain uh, issues beyond our control. Like uh, I have to track tonight or I can't track any other time. I have to work in the morning. Um, and so we may push the envelope a little bit. Uh, oftentimes those deer are still alive when we find them. Not oftentimes, but sometimes they're still alive, but they're very weak. They're you know near death. Um, and then other times we just miss it all together. Uh, liver shot that uh track i went on not too long ago you've probably seen this one the deer charged us in the yep. snow he was hiding in the that was a liver shot and that was 16 hours after the shot wow. and that was and that was only 16 hours because that was when i could get there was that center Normally, I, I don't remember i don't remember the exact uh location was did he center punch the liver on that or just clip it i'd have to go back and look at the details mm -hmm. of my notes um i know it was a liver hit because yeah. i we i stick around when we gut the deer sometimes i gut it sometimes i just let the hunter gut it and i take pictures and document every injury you know and the, the pictures of the liver where the you know the broadhead hit or whatnot but this deer was still alive and and charged us had enough uh energy to get up and charge us but it was weak enough that it only you know ran a couple of feet towards us and then stopped and stood there for a little bit and then laid back down so let me ask your opinion on this shane because this is something that uh, this is something that I've professed, I guess, over the years, and I want to get your take on it. I've always said that there's two different types of gut shots. That, you know, if you're hitting the intestines or you're hitting the paunch. And if I can, if I can suspect that it's a paunch shot, I'll go after it quicker than I would on an intestine shot. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well. I'm only, I've only been doing this five years, so I'm still learning. And I know a lot of the veteran trackers say the same thing you just said, you know, stomach hit, you know, 12 hours, uh, intestine hit 24 hours or even longer to wait. Um, I, my kind of uh, timeline is if it's gut, it has the smell of gut on it or a foul odor, 12 hours, no matter where it was hit back there. Um, if there's stomach matter on it, I mean, that green stuff, gritty mm -hmm. stuff, that's obviously from the, the stomach and not the intestines. But if there's just like deer poop on it, um, that's likely just the intestines. From my tracking experience that all the tracks I've been on, um, most of the intestine hits that I've tracked have been dead or real close to death after that 12 hours. And then the same with the stomach. So even though a lot of the veteran trackers give different wait times for those hits, and say you know the deer could be still alive and, that, and there are cases where that happens um to me or in my experience it's, it hasn't been uh varied enough for me to to start it's, guessing okay it's this interesting is that you say that too because you're i completely agree with your um your wait times but i've often i've often let other things cloud my judgment um whether and I've seen this in your videos where you're like, don't worry about it. You know, it, it, they say, oh, it's too warm. You're not going to recover. It's like, well, if you go after a gut shot after four hours, good luck. Because if you jump that deer, you're not going to probably not going to get back on them anytime soon. Um, and I, I would agree with you on the 12 hours. Uh, the other thing I want to ask you is what are your thoughts on people that say, oh, it's too warm. we got to go after them right now no matter what. Or there's coyotes in the area or... You know, there's a list of things that ex I, I call excuses that people use because they're excited. They want to get out there on that deer. So that's that's the tricky part for like coyotes and snow and rain. You know, people like, oh, it's going to snow overnight or rain overnight or I got to work tomorrow. Those those things right there. I just ignore those. 
you you shouldn't even be concerned with it. Number one, you should if you go decide to go deer hunting, be prepared for something to go wrong, and you know be able to call in to work and say, hey, I'm gonna be in late or I can't make it tomorrow. Possibly, I'll let you know. If you don't have that option, maybe don't go deer hunting that evening. Um, and I know that's with people's limited times these days. It's a I would go deer hunting. <laughs> um, I would just call in sick, I guess, the next morning. But um, those things there, I just kind of ignore. The the one thing that I really pay attention to is the warmth, the temperature. Um, because if the deer doesn't die for 10 hours, the temperature is a non-factor. You know, the deer's blood still circulates. The meat's not going to spoil. But if we get it wrong and like a liver shot, sometimes I've seen liver shots kill deer in 15 minutes. Yep. And I've seen liver shots where 16 hours later, they were still alive. Those are tricky. It's basically a coin toss. Um, you know, how much of that dark blood is on the arrow? Um, you know, where do you think you hit the deer in relation to the liver? And, and do we feel it was a center punch or, or, or different aspects like that? And so sometimes it is a guessing game. But um, a lot of these factors you just have to ignore and, and make your best guess on when the deer will finally expire if, if you give it a minimum of six hours for like a liver shot and the temperatures are warm, then the, there's good odds the meat's not going to be spoiled um, because the deer probably lived for at least, you know, several hours. And then it's only laying there for several more hours. Um, it's just the risk you have to take if you make a, a, a errant shot or have a bad shot. That's, um, excellent and, points that you make there are number one, it's going to take that deer time to expire anyways. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, and, and, and what I really do like is the fact that you quote unquote, ignore those rules. One, one, one point that you brought up, I, I actually have it in my book was the biggest thing is if you can't dedicate yourself to tr looking for that deer, don't go hunting, especially yeah. on a big buck, because I've always said big bucks, the harder, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Y you get one of these, you get a gut shot, you get a liver shot, you get a tweener you know maybe one lung high shoulder something you better expect to be out there for a while i think that's some really good advice um that you provide there I, now I, that's go ahead, go ahead that's a good point you brought up i wanted to touch on uh, my daughter's actually doing a science project about uh sit tracking for dogs and one of the things in there is the factor of uh whether it was a buck or an antlerless deer and I have a, a lot of data saved. I got a buddy that created a little program that um, at some point we're going to make it more available, like on my website, where you can plug in factors. Like, was it a doe? Was it a, a yearling? Was it a buck? And uh, where'd you hit it? And all the factors that go into, you know, a deer hunt. And it'll spit out a percentage odds of successfully recovering that deer. And the the buck and antlerless and i put antlerless because that's does and yearling bucks and, and everything else the bucks always seem to travel farther uh, take longer to die or sometimes you know die less often in the, with the same hit on a doe uh, it's almost like the does and the yearlings don't have the will or the capability of surviving the toughness that a, a buck does not just a mature buck but a buck in general they just seem to be tougher animals and Maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's a, a lifetime of uh, fighting and antlers goring each other. They're they're designed to survive those injuries and heal up from them. I don't know. That's just I pure agree speculation. With, I agree but they percent because they're, they're tougher animals. I've shot deer with big mechanical broadheads through the guts. That on some of those smaller deer, they're dead within minutes. And then on other ones, you gut shoot a big buck, and like you said, a, a day later, you're still looking for them. Now, I don't, like I said, I promise you, I'm not going to turn this into a three hour uh, podcast. So I'm going to try. Yeah, to, we could. I'm going to try. To, <laughs> we really, we probably have to do several of these because I could talk to you hours on this. I wanted to talk, you've already touched on liver shot. I believe that could be a show in and of itself because that one to me is very tricky. Um, mm -hmm. And the way that liver sits in the deer, it's perpendicular. People don't understand that it doesn't fill up that whole chest cavity. And then, like you said, you've got that kind of maroon, mm -hmm. opaque ish blood that's different. Um, that you're looking at. But one thing I wanted to ask you was, um, you, you, you mentioned it, so I wanted to follow up on, what is the percentage of high shoulder shots that you actually recover? Like 1%? Yeah. I mean, it's extremely low. <laughs> now, is um, that a case where you, the guy did catch lung, or have you found some that just bled out? 
Uh, well, we uh, I have recovered some one lung hit deer. And one lung hit deer are different than a high shoulder. A one lung, you actually got into the thoracic cavity or the chest cavity and you penetrated one lung. But a deer can survive on one lung uh, a lot of times. Um, I've actually got um, a deer that we tracked was double lung. He ended up surviving. He ended up getting wow. pictures. Of, the hunter got pictures of him breeding a doe in front of the camera. And you can see the, the entry wound right here behind the one shoulder, one leg, an exit low, just a perfect looking shot. Um, that deer lived for weeks after he shot it and ended up, and the wounds were starting to heal up. He ended up getting hit by a car. And, huh. uh, Jeez. but we, I, I couldn't believe that deer actually survived. We thought the deer, uh, just wandered off and my dog couldn't find it. And uh, just, and I just scratched it off as a non-recovery, you know, deer that we couldn't recover, <clears throat> but high shoulder shots. A lot of people don't realize that the spinal column drops very low right there in the shoulders. I mean, if, if you could, just peel away the hide and the meat and the, the shoulder blade there. The spine is actually down, kind of down below the shoulder blade. And, and most often the knot, what happens, it, it slides right above the spine and they're not getting into the chest cavity. Uh, there's so many people that, uh, oh man, that's, it's at least a single lung. I got eight or 10 inches of penetration. And then they finally get the deer, it's shot later in the season and whatnot, and the, you can see the wounds right above it, or the arrows sticking out on trail camera. They get trail cam pictures, and you can see the arrows clearly above the spine, because I I know enough about the, the anatomy. I was one of these guys, I used to think if you hit there, that was, oh, that was double lung, you know, you got into the chest cavity and I, before I realized how low that the spine actually drops there. So those deer, those deer almost, you know, they're always surviving, unless some type of infection sets in a high shoulder above the spine, which that's where the no man's land term well, that's come that's from. the thing You're i not... wanted to ask you because we've we've done a lot on that topic over the years um do you believe there is a void and um what 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 the the common thought is is that there's a void or no man's land below the spine and above the lungs i'm not going to give my opinion i'm going to let you give your opinion. no no it's it's <laughs> it's not whether i believe it it's just factually incorrect i mean the lungs fill the entire chest cavity um, it's, it's hard to explain an analogy. I like to use is uh, if you took a, a balloon and put it inside of like a two liter Pepsi bottle or something and try to blow that balloon up, you can't because there's a pocket of air outside the balloon in you know, between the bottle and the balloon. And so what happens is the balloon is actually, or the lungs fill the chest cavity. If you could get that, uh, balloon to expand, to uh, butt up against the edges of the bottle, that's how the lungs uh, function that the ribs come in, the diaphragm comes forward and back and forth. And that's how the lungs operate. So if you get into the chest cavity, you're hitting lung or something. What ha I, uh, usually happens is someone slides right above the spine and because it's so low, it looks like it hits the chest cavity excellent. or they get a, or they get a single lung hit and deer often survive those. The single lung hits, we don't have a high recovery of those either. And then the high shoulder shots is like almost non-recovery. I don't think we've ever recovered one that slid above the spine. Um, the high shoulder shots we get end up being just just below the spine and hit one one lung. Excellent point and an ex excellent analogy. It's, it's something that uh, I've, I've tried to, I guess I've beaten my head against the wall enough over the past 28 years. Let me, let me add to that <laughs> real quick um, about the single lung hits. Um, the, the thing you want to do with the single lung deer hit, uh, hit deer is to push that deer and the best way to do that is with a dog because a person cannot scent follow a deer they're not gonna you're not gonna be able to push him by following blood you're gonna be too slow a deer can survive on one lung because the other lungs provide an oxygen but that's at a slower pace walking deer lay you know bedded deer but if a deer has to run that one lung cannot provide enough oxygen and they'll eventually just you know, fatigue and succumb to, you know, no oxygen in the blood anymore. So if you can get a dog on a single lung hit deer and you jump that deer, just keep letting the That's deer, the really dog track point. that deer. And we've recovered at least one that way. Um, that was shot with a rifle, a, a small caliber rifle. Now I'm rifle just guessing that was given. probably a long track once you jumped that deer and, and got on it. No, actually it wasn't really. Um, yeah, the, the deer was shot that afternoon. I got there late that night we started tracking it's very cold temperatures. And so she doesn't, my dog doesn't do well in freezing temperatures. Once you get down in the low twenties and I don't know if it just locks that scent in or what snow's not an issue. Rain's not an issue, but freezing temperatures seem to be an issue. 
Um, so she struggled a little bit to stay on the track, but she finally got locked on and we came up to a, a bed and I didn't notice the blood at first. And I just let her keep going and I stopped her, I turned her back, I came back, restarted and I saw the blood in the bed and it was wet. I was like, oh, this deer just got up a little bit ago. Um, so I asked the hunter if he wanted to keep going. He said, yeah, let's just go a little bit farther. So I went a little bit farther and about 150 yards away was the deer bedded, the buck was bedded. And he let us get to about 40 yards of him and then he jumped up and, and ran off. But he looked weak getting up. And I asked the hunter, we knew, we suspected it was probably a one lung hit um, or maybe not a one lung, but the, the angle of the shot and where he described it, it at least got into the lungs. And I told him, I said, uh, if that's a single lung hit, when I saw that deer get up, we need to keep pushing it. Do we have enough land to keep tracking without crossing a boundary? And he's like, sure. I said, do you want to proceed? He's like, sure. So I told Callie to go and, and I ran behind her. And now she has to be on lead in Wisconsin and Minnesota. This was in Wisconsin. We only went another 150 yards maybe and I come around the curve and there was the deer bedded down again. And he, he didn't have enough energy to get up. And, get up. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, he eventually expired, so uh, we didn't have to worry about that. But just running that deer expired. And I've got other tracker buddies that, you know, track deer for a long ways. And usually that is the case. They go a long ways. And then they jump the deer, and the deer runs 50 yards and just falls over. That wow. last little exertion, um, you know, they just couldn't do it on let, one lung. Let me ask you this, Shane. This is another one. Um, I don't know if you remember Ray McIntyre. He was the – he's – rest his rest his soul he's he's passed he he was the owner of warren and sweat tree stands back in the day heck of a bow hunter. oh i love those tree stands oh man love he those was tree stands. He, a heck of a bow hunter he was down he was from florida and he hunted alabama mississippi georgia but uh, he taught me a lot but he told me in, in his opinion there was a he called it the death dodge and i've paid attention for the past 30 years on this now i think there's something to it. I want to get your opinion on it. He said, now, like what you just talked about, that deer got up, ran another 50 yards, and fell over dead. He said when a deer is getting ready to expire, now on a hit like that where it's like, you you might even have it on a good hit, like on a double long hit, you get that those tracks where you're tracking and like, I got blood, I got blood, I got blood, nothing. Now, I'm not talking about a shoulder hit. I'm talking about a lethal hit. And yep, um, yep. Lo- nothing, and then... He told me that there would be like a point where that deer is going to die and it's either it no longer has its whereabouts with uh, and he said it'll make a 90 degree turn one way or the other and he said chances are if you do like a if you get into one of those situations where you cannot find that blood he said go either way 90 degrees right or left and he said chances are you're going to find that deer within 50 75 yards he said for whatever reason they have enough oxygen in that brain that they can still make another few bounds and that you know that wound might have been clotted up or it might have been you know you know with fat or whatever and i paid attention and i swear that there's something to that and he called it yeah he I, called it death dodges like they're not just gonna like, it's not like a double lung where they just fall over right there but they got enough left in them where it's like you're puzzled and like i don't know where this blood trail went so i, I don't know if this is exactly what he's talking about it, but it sounds like it um i shot a doe one time up here in Minnesota, and I tracked it. I thought it was a perfect shot, had pretty good blood. She ran through some cattails and ended up on an island. I got on the island and trailed it another 30 yards, and then the blood stopped. And I could not find that deer. And I, I kept walking down the trail. It was like a, a long, thin island through the cattails. Um, had I done a little circle there at the last blood, I would have found that deer that night. Um, that deer did a 90 almost almost back back a little bit and ended up 20 yards into the cattails and that's where it died and what i think happens is if you watch these deer videos and you see them shoot a deer and they take off the deer takes off running and it's sitting there standing around and wiggling its tail and all of a sudden it just starts darting i think what they're doing is is the lights are going out just like if you've ever passed out <laughs> Um, and it starts getting darker in tunnel vision. And I think that's what they're doing. And then it's the, the last little bit of That's exactly what Ray was like, talking about. That what you yeah, just described. So, so what happens, they, they run off through the woods. They're, they're, they're actually dying. They're losing uh, their vision. You know, the oxygen is depleting from their body. Um, they're about to expire. And, and I don't know if it's just kind of they lose their whereabouts of where they're at and they just dark 
dart off to the woods and then they fall over somewhere and and they can dart a long ways in uh in just a second or two and they can go so yeah i mean if you lose the blood trip yeah (laughs) and if uh yeah if you get to the last drop um i mean that that gets back to some of these myths and stuff i mean yeah i do circles and stuff like that i'd rather you get a dog in there before you start doing circles but I would search, you know, off to one side. I wouldn't necessarily go way back down the trail, um, but we can talk about all the other stuff. But yeah, that's that. I see that um, in tracks, and I see that it with um, deer I've shot myself. Let's talk just about that. We're we've got about. I, I'm going to go another ten minutes if you can. Let um, yep. let's talk about some of the things that you. Now, I'm not ripping on people, but what do you see? What are the biggest mistakes you see when you show up and it's like, I wish you wouldn't have done that track too soon people are too eager to to go recover their deer and um they don't uh, analyze the situation they think they had a great hit uh, well there's a bunch of big mistakes that could all fall in that number one spot number one they don't uh pay attention after the shot the deer they shoot it it runs off out of sight and they're done they're on facebook they're (laughs) calling their friends um so you should sit there at least a minimum of 30 seconds just listening maybe a minute just listening for you know i've, I've heard multiple times where a deer ran off like the uh, did you see the video of the deer i shot with a recurve my first yes. show okay so i listened after she ran off and i thought i heard a faint crash but i wasn't sure but i heard that had i just been you know right after she ran off gotten loud i never would have heard that so I was hopeful that she was laying over there, even though I didn't have a blood trail. I was following water droplets, and that's exactly what happened. She ran over there, stopped, and then I heard the the very softest grass uh, crash. You know, just a like somebody laying down. Um, but yeah, they track too soon. There's the people. I don't want to blame them because I was the same way early on in life. I, when I'd shoot a deer and I drew blood, I thought that's dead deer. You know, it's I it, may yeah. skip it right across. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so they, they hit in the liver, they hit a little bit far, farther back. I think a lot of people don't understand fully the ad, anatomy of a deer, or the eternals of a deer, and they, they hit right behind the leg. Oh, double lung. But the, uh, it doesn't take much to hit, get into liver back there. You don't have to hit very far back, especially if they're, I guess, if the deer is exhaling at the time of the shot and the diaphragm's pushed forward. So, I mean, you got a, a, quite point. a bit of movement there. Another good point. Um, dead in fault i was listening to him one day and and he was talking about wait times on deer he said deer and i agree with him he says your wait time is either going to be very short or very long there's no in between and i agree you know a lot of people say oh just give them you know two or three hours and let them stiffen up yeah no it's either a lethal hit and it's dead within the first few minutes or it's a bad hit and it's probably going to live at least six hours or longer so that's kind of my my thinking there is, is if you're confident in the hit give it you know, 30 minutes, take your time getting out of the tree, and then you can start tracking. If you're running the issues, mark last blood and back out and get a dog. Uh, if it wasn't a great hit or the deer didn't react like you think, it ran off, stopped, looked around, and walked away, minimum six hours, even if you think it was a good hit. Minimum of six hours. If it's in the evening, just wait till tomorrow morning if the temperatures are sufficient. And, uh, you know, good but point. tracking too soon is number one. One thing that I would add, uh, one thing that I was actually pointing it over at one of our producers because he's a new bow hunter, he came with me last year and I said that, that listening, the listening, like I, what I always say is exactly where was the deer standing? Cause I, I see people come in. I was like, where was, oh, he's over there. Well, where exactly, exactly. Was it by that rock, that stick, whatever, where was the exact pl- last place you saw that deer run? And what did you hear? And I think that is a great point because a lot of times you get out of the stand and you're standing there and now you're kind of trying to get your your direction's kind of screwed up. Mm-hmm. Like you think it was that way. And then you get back up in the sand. It's like, well, actually I heard a snap back that way. And that, that helps. I, th- I think that's, I a good think point. a lot of people have gotten, a lot of people have gotten away from the basics, um, like tissue. And I was guilty of that myself. Visit, you know, mentally mark the spot where the deer was standing from your stand, go down there and mark it with a piece of tissue, mark the blood trail with tissue as you're tracking. Pick you that know, stuff it gives you a up good way line of, <laughs> yeah well if what it's i always tish, tell people if you're hunting on just, somebody else's land away. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah yeah if it's toilet tissue <laughs> it's out in the woods it'll, it'll, it'll be it'll gone in a few yes. days sorry to mean to interrupt um, flag you. i don't like flagging though because of that purpose but anyway stay off the blood trail stand to walk to one side so you're not picking up blood and, and deer scent on your boots as you track in case you need a dog 
and um, and then mark the mark that blood trail with tissue. These days, everyone's marking it with GPS or, or Onyx or whatnot. And I'll go on a track and like, do you have the the trail mark? Yeah, I got it marked on Onyx. And then, oh, let me find it. It's over here. And you know how accurate GPS can be sometimes. Sometimes you can be ten yards off yeah. or twenty yards off. And then I sit there for thirty minutes waiting for them to find the blood trail or the last blood. And there's sometimes where the GPS system just glitches out. I was on a track one time and I used GPS to mark our trail as we we're following. And all of a sudden my blue dot jumped 50 yards yep. over here. It was glitching <laughs> out. And the guy I was with, the hunter I was with, the same experience. And I joked to him, I said, oh, the military must be doing some type of exercise <laughs> and they're just scrambling our GPS. <laughs> I always do that on but, property um, lines. I think I'm on the property line and then that thing just jumps. I'm like, oh, wait, I'm, I'm on the neighbors now. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Run a crowd, run back a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry, jump. Um, what about, uh, let's, let's just briefly talk about what, it, I, and I think it's probably the same common sense things, but you've got your dog out there. What are, uh, you did mention about cold weather, but what are some of the things that uh, affect her ability to stay on a track? Uh, moisture. I love, I love when there's dew, or not too much dew, but there's some moisture. Um, milder temperatures, 50s to 60 degrees. Those are great sitting conditions with, you know, uh, the ground's not really damp, but just has some moisture content to it. Uh, case in point, when uh, we, we got a call for a track, it was, the guy thought it was actually a good shot. It ended up being a gut shot. And thankfully we couldn't get there till the next day. It was a, during the youth hunt. I had my daughter out hunting. It was dry and warm. And he shot it in a soybean field and it ran across the soybean field, hopped the fence and ran towards some houses. They tracked it to that fence and then it kind of went north and then they lost blood. It was 26 hours old when I got there. And this was Callie's first real old track is the, the way I looked at it. And I wasn't, I didn't have, you know, high hopes of recovering or being able to recover this deer or trail this deer. But soon, right when we got out of the truck, as we arrived, it was a fine little mist of rain that started falling down, just adding a little moisture there. And man, did it help tremendously. I put Callie on that track and it was like the deer was just shot two hours earlier. She mm -hmm. followed right to that fence, went through the fence, to their last blood she wheeled around went south from there to a property line i stopped her brought her back told the hunter where we went he said oh we got permission to go across there i said well if she takes them back we'll continue started at last blood she wheeled around went south again across the property line another 300 yards to a little small pond sniffed around it came up the bank and under an oak tree was the the deer and both those guys like that is amazing that is absolutely amazing and i was sitting there like my eyes wide open that yeah that it was amazing even as a tracker but that little bit of moisture just changed things so drastically had it remained dry out there we would probably struggle so um i love mild temperatures like i said anywhere from 40 to 60 is fine with a little moisture content in the, in the soil and that makes for great sinning conditions and now uh, the the, the opposite of that is you don't have Cali and you're going on a blood trail. What, um, I don't want to feed you the answer because I know what I would say. What it, what well, I can would, tell you what to expect. <laughs> what, what to expect and like, how would you, let me, let me put it this way. I shoot a deer. I call you. You don't have your dog. You're going to come help me blood trail. What are you going to tell me? What are your, your, your rules for, um, getting on that blood trail? What, are we, what, what are, yeah, when the, you show up, what are you going to tell me? How are we going to approach this? Without the dog. Without the dog. Yeah. So um, we're going to track it together as buddies. Um, and we've already discussed the wait times. We've waited the appropriate time. Now we're losing blood. Is, um, is that the case? I mean, what I tell people, if they don't have a, a dog, uh, a lot of times I get calls and, and I can't track. If it was a liver hit or, or a gut hit, the deer ran, you know, 50 yards, stopped, wiggled its tail, looked back, and then walked away. If you don't track that deer and come back the next and give it the appropriate wait times, that deer is usually on only a couple hundred yards in the direction you saw it going. And I've helped people recover numerous deer that way. They've gone in there the next day and walked in that direction. That's also what I see in general because I, I GPS trail all my tracks. Deer typically continue in the direction you saw them going. They're trying to put as much distance between the threat, which was something hit them and bit them or caused pain. They're trying to put as much distance between those that place as possible. And the, the quickest way to do that is run straight away. 
and not circle around. So what I tell some people sometimes is if you lose blood and you got a direction of travel on that deer, you've waited the appropriate time, create a cone. And the cone can be narrow and get just slightly wider in the direction you saw the deer. And nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10, maybe not quite nine times out of 10, but a lot, most of the time that deer is going to be found within that cone. You know, once you get out to 200 yards, that cone may be, maybe be 75 yards wide, you know, as you get wider and wider. It also matters where that deer was hit and how long they survive. If a deer lives a long time, like a gut shot or an intestine hit and goes, usually they go off in the direction uh, you saw them last traveling, they bed down, maybe a coyote comes in there and jumps them up, or maybe they just get thirsty after laying there for eight hours and they decide to go to the neighbor's pond. Now, they, now they've now they calmed down after initially running, they bedded down, they calmed down. Now they start thinking, making actual decisions about where I want to go. So then you might get a 90 degree turn and the, and those those get tricky we've recovered deer or found deer um days later that were way off from where we last found blood because they got up and went to the neighbor's pond to get a drink of water um that's also one of the things we should probably touch on real quick is about the myth about water every time someone loses a deer they say oh go search around water i was going to ask you that we minnesota and wisconsin is what the surface area of the two states is about 30 percent water marshes lakes streams we find, I think we found about 2% of the deer we've tracked wow. next to water. And out of the ones, those few that we found near water, there's only like one or two that I think actually bedded there at the water, got water to drink and, and expired. A lot of times what happens is the water is an impediment, like a creek or a swamp, and they stop and they don't want to cross it. So they just bed down next to it. It's not because That's they went there point. for water. What usually happens when people find deer in water, they find it floating in the creek because it expired as it crossed it, or there's thick cover usually around water. I mean, that's where you, if you, especially like a, a property that has timber management, they're not going to be cutting the woods right up to the, the creek or the marsh. There's cattails, there's good thick cover. So if you want to tell someone uh, you're looking for a deer, you lost your blood trail, where do you search? Um, number one, continue in the general direction you saw the deer going or the blood trail was headed and then once you get to grid searching check bedding cover don't look at that water now i mean water will have bedding cover so but don't make the connection that oh there's a pond over there a half mile away maybe he went to that no look look for the bedding cover that's closer and work your way out excellent point um you know i was gonna you can actually give much more detailed uh explanation than that what what i was gonna say is when somebody comes to me and I'm not going on 40 tracks a year. I mean, I mean, I might shoot 10 deer, but I'm not going on 40 tracks like you are. What I always tell, tell people, I got a couple rules. Number one, um, don't go down that trail farther than you. If you think you need help, back out immediately. And then if yep. we're going in there together, I am, I am, I am kind of paranoid this way. I'm not stepping on the blood. I'm always off to the side of the blood because I never know if I have to come back and look at it. And um, the other thing is if it's just two people, one person, normally the person I'm with, they're standing at last blood, and I'm either going looking for the next blood or vice versa. Sometimes I've got people who just got phenomenal eyes, David, phenomenal eyes. David's our executive producer. He can find a pin drop of blood. So he's actually the one leading, um, and I'll be yep. standing back. To me, and that way, I do um, the same thing. Uh, it, to me, it, like, helps – because you don't know you get in there and the other thing is is we're not giving up if we got blood i mean yeah like you said if you got to get to work the next day or whatever but we're not giving up on that tra- as long as we got blood we got hope and we're going to keep and then it, when we don't have hope we're going to do some of the crazy stuff like grid but, searches but with like that, that said with that said uh, wait times appropriate wait yep. times because so, i know some guys they get too giddy when they they see blood i i was tracking for some guys and and they had lost blood and brought callie in there and she took me several hundred yards without blood and all of a sudden I found blood and I called the hunters up to this new blood we found. And I'm like, yeah, I think we should back out and give this, this deer more time. It looks wet. Maybe we, it was, you know, the deer got up before we got here and oh, wow. They just turned, tuned me out. They were like, oh man, more blood up here. And they just, uh, they got so excited. I was like, listen, fellas, you need to calm down and you know get your heads you know, squared away, cleared up because you're making a bad decision. If you start and, 
it took some convincing to finally get the hunter and say, yeah, he's right. We need to back out and then and, and come back and later. There and there are times like that where you do have to call an audible where you think, well, I think I'm trailing an XYZ type shot. And then you get in mm-hmm. there and it's like, oh, maybe not. Now we got, and that, and that is, the, the wait times is that overriding message, I think, that is, like you said, well, it's not only beneficial, it's going to probably increase your probability that you're going to find that. Deer. I know I know exactly how hard it is to stop trailing a deer when you have blood. I mean, look at my North Dakota hut that's on my YouTube channel. That that shot looked pretty good, but the deer was slightly quartered to. We suspected one long liver maybe, and as a tracker, I should have known to just back out then. But we were following blood. We even found blood that and a bedding, uh, a wound bed with dark blood on one side and, and lighter blood on the other. And I said, yeah, this is the entry. There's the exit with the liver blood. And I even mentioned in the video, I know, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there going, I'm a tracker. I know better. And, and I, it was still hard for me to stop following this deer, uh, and, and just back out. So I, I know it's easy for me to tell people just back out. But when you're in that actual situation and you think the deer is going to be laying dead, just another 30 yards away like oh we'll just keep pushing on but um, most times what happens if if you've gone 150 to 200 yards and you haven't recovered that deer yet something ain't right <laughs> you know mm-hmm. most most deer that are leaked uh, double lunged or hard don't go uh past 200 yards in most cases not always but in most cases awesome well i would love to sit here for another three hours but we're not going to do that he is shane simpson you got to check out his videos on YouTube. It's uh, YouTube backslash Shane Simpson hunting, or that's where you're going to find all the videos, or you can go to his website, shanesimpsonhunting.com. Shane, I would love to talk public land hunting with you because I've watched those videos. I want to talk turkey hunting with you because I think you could teach us all a couple of lessons, but I see that turkey you better, hanging you on better the get me on before, <laughs> in the back You better get there. me on before next week. Yeah, you're going to be gone. I know that. You're going to be gone. Uh, yeah. uh, then now, did, tell me if I got that stat right. It's like 20 championships you've won uh, calling calling titles? Yeah, it's a, it's a couple more than 20 um, state and um, and other state divisions, like Iowa and Minnesota. And then I went to Grand Nationals in Nashville and tied for first in the Alley, but lost in the in the uh in the call off did you um, get to uh, did you get to go on letterman uh, no no <laughs> I, I, I spent... they, they stopped they stopped doing that <laughs> they stopped doing that years ago before i oh, before i started comp- or how... about the time i started about the time i started competing okay, i got friends that have been on the show <laughs> i stayed with chris Parrish at his house uh the year that he was on letterman and i just remember coming to work so like proud like i stayed in that guy's basement you know, he was uh, Chris Perry. I know that guy. Yeah, I know that guy. He makes calls, and he's a champion caller. Well, yeah. Shane, thank you very much for joining us. We very much appreciate your time and uh, wealth of knowledge, as always. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me on. All right. 